Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Goulder, a contributing editor with Tax Notes. Welcome to the latest episode of In the Pages, uh, the feature where we take a more in-depth look at some of the thought-provoking pieces that run in our publications. Now, today, uh, we're dealing with a topic that I suspect will, will touch a few nerves out there. That's because we're talking about transfer pricing, and in particular, the legitimacy of the arm's length standard. Now, if you are accustomed to this practice area at all, you know that the arm's length standard is embedded in U.S. federal law under Section 482 of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, but moreover, the arm's length standard, it can really accurately be described as a global norm. It provides the foundational basis of, of many, many countries' transfer pricing regimes, not just ours. So we really are talking about a worldwide construct. Now, at its core, the arm's length standard seems so straightforward. To describe it in a nutshell, it would be this. If you were tasked with... Um, uh, pricing a related party transaction, uh, you would try to approximate the price charged by unrelated parties for the same good or service. Uh, if they were, you know, not related entities, uh, the, the key phrase there being if they were unrelated entities, which in other words, that gets to a hypothetical inquiry. Uh, well, that's basically where the simplicity ends, because the deeper you get into transfer pricing, the more complex it gets. What is so controversial about all of this? Well, two things come to mind, and we'll get into them very shortly. Uh, trend, uh, the arm's length standard is associated with a lot of profit shifting. Also, people, apart from that, will ask whether it's really a coherent standard to arrive at the right answers economically. Not everyone thinks so. Well, today's guest author knows a thing or two about transfer pricing. And in fact, he knows a lot about business and economics generally. He is Bill Parks, a retired finance professor and uh, founder of an employee-owned uh, company based in Idaho, NRS Incorporated. Over the years, Mr. Parks has been a vocal critic of the arm's length standard uh, to the point where he's almost really one of the leading proponents internationally of this alternate policy that we refer to as sales factor apportionment, uh, which provides a very different approach to dealing with these related party transactions. His article, which we are profiling here today, is titled Arm's Length, Principle or Cult? And it first appeared this fall in the October 26th edition of Tax Notes International. And it received um, quite a reaction. I suppose not everyone uh, likes being labeled a, a member of a cult. But objectively speaking, uh, the author does make some really astute observations. And that's what we're here to talk about. So without any further ado, let's hear from the author, Bill Parks. Welcome to In the Pages. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the honor of being here. And uh, I, I guess I would say, uh, yes, it's, it's certainly not a principle. And if it's not a principle, maybe it's a cult. And the reason is not that the um, arm's length is, is wrong. It's that it's based on a faulty base, which is separate accounting. Separate accounting is saying, for instance, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have any money to pay for this with my right arm because my left hand arm has all my cash. Uh, that makes no sense. And it makes no sense to separate a company into its parts in arbitrary ways so that we can assign profits to one of those subsections of a multinational corporation. Well, this this concept of separate entity accounting, uh, it goes back a long time. I mean, it's almost 90 years old. It's part of the so-called international consensus that is reflected in the OECD model tax convention and the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, along with things like the permanent establishment doctrine and, and arm's length pricing. Um, 
Now, your article, when you, when you talk about whether this is a, a, a flawed concept, let's dig deeper into that. What are your primary objections with arm's length? Is it, is it just the separate entity accounting, or is it more than that? Well, I think the separate entity accounting enables arm's length principles or arm's length standard. And if you don't allow separate accounting, and by the way, yes, it's 90 years old, but back in, I think, uh, 1923, the International Chamber of Commerce suggested in, that if there were going to be disputes that they should be settled on the basis of sales. So we had a chance to go the right way uh, 97 years ago, and we didn't. We went the other direction. And I think at the time, it made sense because most of the imports and exports were commodities. However, very early, corporations figured out, well, I can put the insurance for this shipment and the financing for this shipment and the logistics for this shipment all in separate entities and put those entities into tax havens. So from the beginning, it didn't work the way it was supposed to work because if you take the... Uh, transportation and this insurance and the logistics uh, and, and financing and put them in uh, tax havens, then you can have little or no profit in, in the uh, source country or, or the residence country or what have you. In other words, you can, from the beginning, you can manipulate where the profits go. So what you're saying is that the problem has already been there. It's sort of inherent in the policy. It's not the case that we get to the 80s or 90s or the era of globalization or so forth or the digital, digital economy, and all of a sudden the system starts to break down. You're saying the ability to manipulate these uh, uh, controlled party transactions and the pricing, the ability to manipulate has always been there from the start. Yes, and I think there was a Reuters article maybe uh some years ago, showing slices of a banana, showing that very little of the banana profits ended up where it was sold and very little of it where it was grown. But in between all of the slices, including uh, uh, the names of, of, you know, trade names of the bananas and so forth, were all put in uh, tax havens. And that's been going on. If you can do it with a banana, you know, there's a famous article by Ed Kleinbard about the uh, how how Starbucks was able to avoid all taxes um, in the UK. And the only reason they ever paid taxes was when it became public. The public was so outraged that they said, oh, we don't owe you any money. We'll just give you a few billion um, million dollars here. Uh, and actually, that was otherwise uh, in the UK, they probably would have had a boycott that would have been very more expensive. So it, it, it can't be fixed because it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, if you read a transfer pricing book, within the first few pages, it will say that the purpose of transfer pricing is to minimize the taxes or um, the equivalent, because they're also tariffs, um, the cost to the company. So how can you have transfer pricing whose purpose is to minimize the taxes? And so although ALP or ALS, which whatever you want to call it, uh, looks benign. It's not. It's it's a very dangerous and and terrible thing. And so I, I guess I could go on for 
<laughs> more, but uh, you've got more questions. So I, I do have more questions. And I, I have some friends who do, I mean, this is how they make their living. They do transfer pricing. When I ask them in a nutshell, describe what it is that you do, they'll say that they, you know, manipulate the price of, of related party transactions to shift all the items of gain right all, all the taxable items shift the income to a low tax jurisdiction and if you have expenses anything that's deductible like interest on a loan or depreciation or whatnot anything that's deductible you shift that to a high tax um jurisdiction so yeah that sort of goes to your point about the instruction manual says the whole purpose is to lower taxes not necessarily to get it economically the right answers so no so uh in your article, you offer a couple of examples. I think you labeled them examples one, two, and three to, to illustrate to readers how this all plays out. And I was wondering if you could run through just briefly the first of those examples. It involves a pharmaceutical company. Um, and I don't think it really matters whether the, it's headquartered in the US or abroad, but you mentioned that it's got two subsidiaries, uh, one pharmaceutical subsidiary in the US and another one in Bermuda. With that background, could you just run us through that example to show us sort of the folly uh, of, of how this all works? Well, the idea is that you have to transfer a patent at its value. And so immediately that it gets the, company gets uh, a patent in the United States or wherever, it immediately transfers it to Bermuda. Bermuda has no corporate tax and it's not worth much. So you can't argue the value of it because it hasn't been proven. Then if it turns out to be say an arthritis drug like, like uh, Humira, you lease the rights back to the United States and probably to many other countries at a very high price. And therefore it never makes a profit in the US. It loses more money. It actually shows more profits outside the US than it has sales outside the US. So how do you, how do you have more profits outside the US than you have sales? Well, you, you see how it, how it works. Isn't that an unlevel playing field? Because not all companies have offshore affiliates. If you're a purely domestic company, you can't really do transfer pricing, can you? No, and, and that's, the, that's the point. Uh, who suffers from this? Well, any domestic company competing with a multinational company is at a great disadvantage. And not only that a disadvantage, but it can be bought by a multinational that will pay more for it than any other domestic company or that it's worth domestically, or even a foreign multinational can come in and buy it because it's worth more if it doesn't pay tax than it is, does, than it is if it pays uh, federal and state taxes. Let me ask you a little about the role of uh, the IRS and Congress here, because it sounds like we're describing a broken system. So, so why hasn't the government done more to crack down on these transfer pricing abuses? Certainly the IRS has resources to issue a statutory notice of deficiency to a company that it suspects on audit is doing some really aggressive transfer pricing. I have to say from just working for, for, for tax notes and looking at the publication every week, over the course of many years, it looks like the IRS loses the vast majority of those lawsuits when they actually get to court. I, I know there's some some very recent in the last couple of uh, months, some exceptions to that, where they've had the rarity of actually winning a transfer pricing uh, uh, lawsuit. But you know the the incentive there when when other companies see that the IRS is losing case after case that just encourages them to be bolder so what do you think has been so problematic about about enforcement well i think that they've been dealt a very bad hand how can you argue um because transfer pricing has a range you can't say that any price of any good that isn't a commodity has a set price. So how do you, how do you value, let's say, a, a patent? Or in how much do you charge for the use of the patent? 
how much is Starbucks logo worth in a Starbucks cup of coffee? You know, it's not just that it's um, a cup of coffee, it's a cup of coffee with a Starbucks logo on it. It's a cu cup of coffee uh, with a blend, a Starbucks blend. And then it is roasted by a Starbucks secret method. And so how do you, how do you argue that the roasting, which adds value, how do you argue how much value it adds? That's, that's a very tough thing. And I think the only thing that the IRS does is they win because some companies are, are, are so outrageous in how they are pricing things that uh, it, you know, if, if they price it in such a way that the US company makes no profits, uh, you know, it's just, and there are so many ways to do it. You, you, you put your banking subsidiary in a uh, tax haven and then you loan money to the US company and you loan it at a high price. There are just innumerable ways. I, I think the IRS um, probably has done as good a job as it could uh, given a broken system. Well, you make a really interesting point about uh, commodities, because, uh, you know, if we were talking about um, the, the transfer pricing associated with a barrel of crude oil that had an objectively verifiable market price, we wouldn't be talking about any of this. You would just look at a benchmark, a very readily identifiable benchmark and say that's the price for a barrel of oil that uncontrolled parties would charge. But but we're not dealing with anything like that. There are no comparables, but the system all seems to be built on the idea that you can just, oh, look, there's a comparable. There's what there's what unrelated parties would do, but that doesn't really exist. So as you say, the IRS, they lose most of these cases, but really they've just been dealt a bad hand. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the role of the OECD. Now, our readers will know that stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They're based in Paris, uh, and they include about 35 or so of the, your, your, your major capital exporting economies. Um, basically, you know, the rich man's club, um, where, where most of the, the world's multinational corporations are, are, are established in one of these OECD countries. You describe their traditional posture towards an arm's length standard as monolithic support. But is that being being chipped away at all? Can you can you describe what you think is, is going on here? Because traditionally they've they've liked the arm's length standard, right? Yeah. And you know the fact that they are opening up and splitting and I think uh ordinary versus residual profits, I think that immediately says, uh-oh, we're gaming something in some way again. But as they started to move towards this, the US Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin, uh, Mnuchin uh, sent a letter, which I think was supposed to be quiet, saying that there should be a um, safe harbor. In other words, that any US company should be able to do what it was doing without any, um, without any interference. But it came out that Mnuchin had had a luncheon, I think it was, with a number of CEOs of multinationals, and they had persuaded him that this ridiculous idea, which was, if we're going to fix the system a little bit, we should let these US multinationals continue in the way that they are going now without any interference. And that just tells you how powerful the multinationals are. So what this implicates is what's known as the pillar one reform proposal with the OECD inclusive framework, where they're basically saying rather than use the current system that we have. You look at a corporation and you take its profits and you put it under a magnifying glass and um, you try to separate ordinary profits from extraordinary profits. And you, you 
take the, the, the ordinary profits and you treat them the way you always have, and maybe you give the source countries a little slice to be determined of the residual profits. Uh, and yeah, you wonder if all the gaming that currently takes place in other areas will move to gaming, what, you know, whether a profit is, is a residual profit or not. That seems like a very loose standard, but we don't want to get too deep into um, that, that um, pillar one proposal. You've talked about uh, this idea of, of, of doing something with the United Nations uh, Article 12B idea. How, how, how does that stand in contrast to the OECD Pillar 1 reform? Well, uh, it, it is in contrast because it gives a specific number, and the number is 30% of profits. Now, the downside is that all they're talking about is the digital companies. So I'm suggesting that we take the given, which is 30% from the UN, and apply it to the uh, OECD pillar one and say 30%. And to heck with trying to figure out what's a residual or an extraordinary or an ordinary profit, just take that and then add in not just digital, but everything else, uh, the OECD says uh, consumer facing uh, companies, and I don't know, is, is, a, is a pharmaceutical a, a consumer facing company? I think not because it's selling to a distributor or whatever, or a pharmaceutical uh, chain in, in a country. So I think, I think we have to expand it to everything. Uh, if we don't, um, then they're going to create uh, third parties in there and reduce the number. So I, I just think you have to say all of it is, uh, is taxable and 30%. So that's, that's what I'm suggesting. Oh, to me, when I first read your article, I took the highlighter and, and, and hit that section with the yellow ink because uh, I wanted to go back and look at it. It really is an interesting proposal to take the best of, of what's in the, the United Nations proposal, but not their scope, because the scope of what the United Nations proposes is very small. They only want to apply that 30 percent apportionment to to digital companies as opposed to the whole rest of the global economy. So it's interesting how you, 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 you're not just blindly taking what the UN says and sort of stuffing that into the pillar one box. You're, you like the, you know, a broader scope, but the apportionment factor, 30%, you think is superior to trying to nitpick over, you know, what's, what's a residual profit as opposed to a normal profit. If for the listeners out there, if you really want to go back and look at Mr. Parks's article, that's what you should focus on because it's a very interesting way to combine the OECD and the UN proposals. Let's talk about what I'm going to call the plain vanilla version of formulary apportionment. When I first learned formulary apportionment, it was in the in the um, uh, under the paradigm that there would be three apportionment factors. Uh, could you explain a little bit about how that works? Sure. What happened was um, going way back to 1911, uh, Wisconsin started trying to tax the railroads, and if they had said, well, you make this amount of profit in the railroad, um, the railroad would say, no, we don't make any profit in Wisconsin. It's all made in, in um, Delaware where we're headquartered and where there isn't at that time any uh, corporate tax. So through the years, uh, starting sometimes they did property, sometimes they did sales, whatever, but by the 1950s, they arrived at a consensus. And remember, the basis of the tax is supposed to be activities. So they took and they said one third on payroll, um, and although that may be personnel costs, uh, maybe salaries or, or headcount, one third on property, and that's pretty obvious, and the other third on sales. And that was just, and it makes sense as an activity, if you're taxing activities, 
then you do that. Um, and, and so that's, that was chosen by all states. And in fact, the multi-state tax commission or someone suggested <laughs> that that was the only legal way that you should be able to tax uh, corporate taxes at the state level. Well, that seems perfectly reasonable. Three factors, uh, payroll, property, and sales. So you have the states doing it. Was that sustainable? Well, it was sustainable for a long time. Back in the 1960s, um, Iowa just taxed on sales. And the reason was because they could say to a company that was going to expand and was in Wisconsin, well, if you put your next factory in Iowa, you won't pay any more taxes. But if you put your next fact factory in Wisconsin, you will, because the payroll and the, um, and the property will be added. So that was powerful. And it took a long time for other states to pick up on it. But now about 27 states do um, just sales. Um, a number of them, maybe 13 or so, do um, double or triple or quadruple weighted sales. And there are only about less than half a dozen that do, um, that do three factor. And the ones that do three factor, um, let's take Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a huge oil industry, but most of that oil and natural gas is exported. So if you just did it on sales, they would escape but they can't move because that's where the wells are. So they're on, on three factor. And I expect them to stay on three factor unless the oil companies go out and lobby heavily to do just on sales. And that's what we found uh, that industry tends to push. Uh, if you have a big industry in a particular state, they'll try to push onto sales unless it's a state like California, where it has a huge market and they may not have any factories, then they want to see three factor in California. So do you want to tax things that you don't want to uh, encourage? Yes, you want to tax cigarettes and you tax them at a high price partially because you want to discourage them. But no state wants to discourage uh, locating a sales office or a factory in that state. So if you tax it, you're saying, we don't want you. So if you do it just on sales, you're saying to that company, yes, we want you. And so um, it's not just on activities that we're, that we're taxing. In this case, we tax on sales because it is competitively uh, a good deal. And any country that did the same thing would also be saying, locate your factories and locate your personnel in XYZ country because you don't pay more. And if you don't like it, don't sell in our country. There's a lot there to unpack. Uh, Bill. Uh, I mean, it makes perfect sense when you think about it. You've got those three factors we talked about. Payroll, well, that can sort of be described as a tax on jobs. And why would you want to do that? Because, you know, if you tax something, you're going to have less of it. Um, the, the property factor kind of resembles a tax on investment. And again, you want more investment, not less investment. So so if, if the, the payroll factor is bad for lack of a, or uncompetitive for lack of a better word. And if the property factor is uncompetitive, what does that leave? That just leaves sales. And so, so I'm more of an international tax guy. And, and, and when I try to make sense of uh, what the states are doing, there's a very interesting parallel between state competition and international competition. You said it was just less than uh, half a dozen states that are still doing three factors. If the state governments don't have sort of the, 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 the wherewithal or the discipline st to stick to three equally weighted factors, is it naive to think that national sovereign governments would be any different? Because I, I have 
friends who would say, let's have an international system based on three-factor formulary apportionment. And the experience of the U.S. states just speaks so loudly there. Is that what, what, what your thoughts are? Well, yes. Um, but, but right now, of course, with the um, arm's length, you can strip uh, profits out to a tax haven. Uh, so whether you do three-factor or sales factor, that's a big improvement, either one. Um, but competitively, you're better off really with uh, sales factor uh, for the reasons we're talking about. You don't want to tax things that you want to encourage. And every country wants more payroll and more, more property in, in their country because those are positive things and taxing them uh, is unfortunate. Now, if some kind of a sales factor apportionment system were to take off and go mainstream, say, say we woke up tomorrow and the OECD said, for, forget arm's length, we're going to go to sales factor apportionment, who stands to lose? Well, um, multinationals, uh, the domestic companies would gain uh, because they're paying the full boat of taxes already and where the multinational is not. So they would gain and all the rest of us would gain because sooner or later, we or our descendants are going to have to make up for the taxes that are being lost and they are substantial. So in the case of state to state competition, uh, when you have sales factor apportionment, it's almost as if the, um, you know, the, the, the people making the decisions for state X are looking for a way to export the, 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 the tax burden to the residents of, of state Y. You know, that, that it, it has that flavor of exporting the tax base. But what you seem to be saying is that when we take this and convey it to, to country versus country competition, it's less about exporting the tax base and more about just putting the tax burden back on the companies. Am I, am I correct in that? Yes. And furthermore, if you did sales factor, you wouldn't care how Bermuda taxed. Go ahead, Bermuda tax, tax all you want uh, or don't tax. It doesn't matter to the United States. It doesn't matter to England. An example, for instance, is that Ireland is about a tenth the size in population of England, France, Germany, or Italy, and yet they uh, they have supposedly a substantial amount of of uh, profits in there. But if England were to tax based on sales, they really wouldn't care what. Ireland did, even if they had a zero tax rate in Ireland, it wouldn't matter. And that is the thing that makes sales factor apportionment so so intellectually appealing to me, because it, it's almost as if it, it, it gets rid of the race to the bottom. And, and readers will know what I mean by the race to the bottom. It's the idea that another country can poach your corporate tax base by having having lower rates. As you say, it just doesn't matter what the rates are in the Cayman Islands or or Singapore or any place like that. You just look at where the sales are. So so what would that mean for the United States? I, I'm trying to anticipate what the uh, what an, an outcome for the United States would be because on one hand. I've always thought of the United States as a, a you know a capital exporting economy. You know we're kind of like a, you know the, the the residence country to all these multinationals. On the other hand, we have a, a vast consumer market over three hundred population of over three hundred forty million people. So we're sort of both a market country and a, a, a residence country. How do you think a sales factor apportionment system at, at the international level? How would that affect the U.S. Both the well, I, and the FISC? Well, I think the U.S. would benefit of, in, in a couple of ways. One is they would make a lot more money. A second was you wouldn't pay more taxes if you located your next factory in the U.S., uh, which may or may not be what you want to do. But thirdly, that the states are missing 
about $17 billion a year of taxes that they could pay if they were taxing based on the worldwide rather than what's called water's edge. In other words, uh, a company shows that it made a lot of money worldwide, but it lost money uh, in the US. Now, no state then can tax those worldwide profits now because they all have a limitation, an option to companies to only be taxed on uh, domestic sales and domestic shown profits. Fascinating stuff. Uh, we need, we're, we're working towards the end of our interview here, but I just wanted to see, ask you a final wrap up question here, Bill. Do you think the world is ready for sales factor apportionment? And if not now, when? Well, I, I think that's a, that, that, that's a good way of putting it. If not now, when? It takes one brave country. It ta would take one brave state. Uh, in California, a number of people have offered, and uh, including the uh, chair of the Senate Finance Committee in California, have offered um, an amendment which would get rid of the water's edge limitation so they could tax a portion of the worldwide uh, sales and so forth and profits. And that gets shut down immediately. It gets shut down by the multinational. It never ever makes it out of, um, out of committee. Uh, we worked in another state and a big multinational just opened up and we were told that the, it would never even be considered. Um, but sooner or later, some state may do that. And why not the US? particularly with the COVID problem, all the states and the US are running, well, the, the states aren't running deficits because they can't, but they're really hurting. And the federal government is going to be running huge de uh, deficits. Why not allow the US to go after the multinationals and add, uh, particularly now probably 70, $80 billion a year for free because it's all for multinationals that aren't paying anything today or very little. Very well said. Uh, I think you've identified the issue there and who the opponents are. Um, Sadly, that is all the time we have for this episode of In the Pages, so we're going to need to wrap it up. In conclusion, I'd like to add, really, that whatever your views on transfer pricing are, you should go find Bill's article. Again, it was in the October 26th edition of Tax Notes International. If you're a subscriber, you can find it in the archive. Uh, it's well worth read, and he raises some absolutely fascinating issues. And, you know, frankly, it does seem, when you think about it, the OECD, they might be growing a little bit more comfortable with some of these apportionment uh, concepts. So so who knows what pillar one or pillar two will look like uh, when the dust settles. Um, and as you say, arm's length standard, it's been around for almost 100 years. It, it's not going to go away with, without some, some pushback. I suspect, Bill, that this is not the last time uh, we're going to be having a discussion about arm's length or sales factor apportionment. I look forward to you writing on this uh, article again in the future, maybe when we've had some more developments at the state or the international level. Um, really, thank you for writing this article, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, thank you. On that note, time to say goodbye. Until next time, take care, everyone. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.